This is True Crime Out Loud. I'm your host, B. And I'm your host, Jen. And before we get started, I'd like to welcome everybody back from the holiday break. We had a good time getting some rest and a little R&R from the weekly grind of the podcast, but we're also very glad to be back and looking forward to covering this topic. We have received several requests for this case, so we're going to throw a few shout outs out. Thank you to John from Texas, Linda from Texas, Lauren from Minnesota, Cece from New Jersey, James from Alabama, and Trisha from North Carolina. And a very special happy 51st wedding anniversary to Carl and May Hurt in Missouri. Keep sending us those case requests and we'll try to cover as many of them as we can so that we make sure you guys are hearing what you want to hear. This will be the beginning of our three-part series on Charles Manson and the Manson family and their crimes. In this episode, we're going to cover kind of the beginnings of Charles Manson and the formation of the Manson family. In order to understand the time period that this all takes place, we're going to need to understand a little more about the decade that this took place in. And normally, you know, we give you a few little facts about the area and the time, and we're going to go with that, but we're going to focus more on the decade for this particular case. In the 1960s, was very tumultuous time in American history. It was the civil rights movement time, the Vietnam War. You had anti-war protests going on, the assassination of an American president. It was the time of peace, love, and drugs. In 1961, John F. Kennedy became president, and with him came all this hope to eliminate injustice and inequality and move really move the country forward. It was a time of excitement in America. But he was assassinated in 1963, and a lot of people would tell you that a lot of the hope for that decade kind of died with him. The 1960s also saw the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Bay of Pigs invasion. And after President Kennedy's assassination, the vice president, Lyndon Johnson, assumed the office of the president. And he promised to kind of continue some of the things that Kennedy had promised. He was going to turn the U.S. into a great society with no poverty or racial injustice. And he found that a tall hill to climb. Under Johnson, uh, Medicare and Medicaid were developed along with the Head Start program and the Job Corps. The Vietnam War quickly became a top priority for President Johnson because what was a small-scale conflict under President Kennedy had turned into a full-blown war. In 1964, Congress authorized the president to take all necessary measures to protect American soldiers and their allies from the Viet Cong, and soon after, the draft was initiated. The first half of the 60s, up until Kennedy's assassination, was full of promise and full of hope, as I mentioned. And even after Johnson took over, there was still that clinging to hope for the 60s, for America. And once the draft was instituted in 1964, the war just divided the U.S. Many people took to the streets to protest the war, while the silent majority supported the war. There were those who dodged the draft and flee to Canada to avoid the draft or openly burn their draft cards in defiance of the draft. In 1964, President Johnson pushed a Civil Rights Act through Congress prohibiting discrimination in public places. So we can see already that the 60s have been kind of a mishmash of good things and bad things. A lot of progress was made in the area of civil rights, but we had the Vietnam War going on that was dividing the country and a president that was assassinated. And in 1965, Malcolm X was assassinated. And this kind of built a fervor within the U.S. A student activist became more radical with anti-war demonstrations. And we see the birth of hippie culture and Hippies, as they were known in the 1960s, began to drop out of the mainstream lifestyle. They grew long hair and practiced free love, formed communes where they lived. And these were all things that may not seem that far out of the societal norm for today. Like long hair is not something that we would notice 
as something that really jumps out as, oh man, that, but in the 1960s, that was a big thing. Uh, sexual freedom is another thing that I think we kind of take for granted today. I don't know that people really give too much thought to sexual freedom, but it was definitely something that was a new concept for the 1960s. Another key milestone of the 1960s occurred in Memphis, Tennessee on April 4th of 1968. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, and as everyone knows, King was the leader of the civil rights movement for nearly a decade and was really the face of the civil rights movement, more so than Malcolm X even. And in June of 1968, another champion of civil rights, this time a person who also in, was involved in politics, Senator Bobby Kennedy, was assassinated in Los Angeles. So you can see that this decade was just rife with tragedy. And although there was a lot of good that came out of this decade, there was also a lot of tragedy. And that brings us to 1969. And this is where we're going to start with the Manson crimes, because this is where they really began to escalate. Some interesting facts about 1969. The Pontiac Trans Am was born in 1969. PBS, the public broadcast system, was established and debuts Sesame Street. Walmart was incorporated as Walmart Stores, Inc. And in keeping with this progression of social this adaptation of social policies, a landmark Supreme Court case, Stanley v. Georgia, ruled that the state cannot prohibit possession of obscene material for personal use. In spring of 1969, President Nixon began drawing down the U.S. involvement in Vietnam, and Mickey Mantle retired from the New York Yankees. James Earl Ray pled guilty to killing Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and was sentenced to 99 years in prison. In April of 1969, Sirhan Sirhan is convicted of killing Bobby Kennedy and sentenced to death, which was later overturned. On June 28th of 1969, the Stonewall Rebellion in New York occurred, and that is considered the birth of the homosexual rights movement. In July of 1969, something that had been talked about since the beginning of the decade occurred, and that was the Apollo 11 moon landing. 1969 also featured the Beatles' last public performance on the roof of Apple Records, in which that was a kind of an impromptu concert that ended up being broken up by police. The Beatles are going to play a role in the rest of the Manson story. And the year was kind of capped off in August, when 400,000 young people went to upstate New York for the Woodstock Music Festival that lasted three days. A ticket to this event, which we've all heard of Woodstock, a ticket to this event was $18. It featured legends such as Joan Baez, Janis Joplin, Jefferson Airplane, and Jimi Hendrix. The Who also played there. The people who put on Woodstock expected 50,000 attendees, but they were overwhelmed at the size of the crowd and finally declared it a free show. It took place in what was essentially a cow pasture, and it was billed as three days of peace and music. So this is a brief overview we glossed over. We had dozens of important events that happened in the 1960s, and we tried to hit some of the high notes. And we can see that the Manson family and Charles, Mans and Charles Manson's story as an adult takes place in this time of great change and social and civil unrest in the U.S. A lot of positive and a lot of negative. A, a very unique time in U.S. history. And like B described, there were many events that shaped the 60s to make them what they were. And we're going to talk about the Manson family, but before we do that, we need to know about Charles Manson and how he came to be. He was born to 16-year-old Kathleen Maddox on November 12, 1934. She was reported to sometimes be a prostitute. She had grown up in a strictly religious home in West Virginia. She gave birth to Manson, and he wasn't actually given a name right away, and his birth certificate had him listed as No Name Maddox. Kathleen said Manson's father was Colonel Scott of Ashland, Kentucky, now, Colonel Scott was not 
really an actual colonel in the military, but was married, and he didn't want to have anything to do with Kathleen or no-name Maddox. So Manson never met his biological father. She ended up naming her child Charles Mills Maddox. Kathleen married William Eugene Manson sometime around the birth of Charles Manson. And eventually, Charles Manson took the name of his stepfather. So he became Charles Mills Manson, a.k.a. Charlie. Now, Kathleen, his mother, was a wild child and she didn't stay married to William very long it was about three years when Manson was about five years old she he was still living with his mother and she was moving them all over the place from man to man to man well at this time in his life Kathleen and her brother were involved in an armed robbery Kathleen convinced a man to take her to a gas station. Her brother was waiting there, and the brother stuck a gun into the man's back and demanded his money. There was a, a fight. Altercation broke out. He hit the man in the head with this gun that was actually a ketchup bottle. So the man was injured. Kathleen and her brother are arrested for armed robbery, and she's sentenced to five years in prison. So Manson goes to live with an aunt and uncle in McMeckin, West Virginia, and they were also very religiously strict. Now, Manson himself said he was a handful, but he said his uncle was abusive. Manson recalled one incident where he cried about something that happened at school, so his uncle made him wear a dress to school. Basically, if you're going to act like a girl, you're going to dress like one. Well, Kathleen gets out of prison after only three years, and Manson goes back to live with her. But the same as before, not a stable life. They continued moving around, and the mother committed her life to heavy drinking and men and having a good time, not her child. But Manson stayed with his mom for five years, and then he was sent to Gabalt School for Boys in Terre Haute, Indiana. Now, this school was run by Catholic priests. Manson hated this school, and he ran away. He ran away back to his mom, but she sent him back to the school. She really just didn't want to raise him. He ran away a second time to Indianapolis, Indiana, where he burglarized stores and committed petty crimes to survive. And he even got enough money from his crimes to rent a room. But Manson got caught committing burglaries, and a judge sentenced him to Boys Town in Omaha, Nebraska, when Manson was around 13 years old. He goes there. He runs away four days later, and he goes to Illinois in a car that he stole. He was caught again, and he was involved in robberies, and so he was sent to Indiana School for Boys. While at this school, he ran away 18 times. Manson said during his time there, he was repeatedly beaten and raped. During one of the times he ran away from there, he committed more robberies and thefts, so he was sent to the National Training School for Boys in Washington, D.C. This is a place where you get it together and you straighten up. Well, Manson seemed to do well here, and he wound up from the school getting transferred to the National Bridge Honor Camp because he was doing so well, and he had a parole hearing set for 1952. However, just before his parole hearing, where he was most likely going to be released, he was caught raping another boy by placing a sharp weapon to his neck. Some reports say a knife, some say razor, some say a sharp piece of glass, Whatever the case, it was a sharp instrument to another's neck, and he raped him. He was then sent to the Federal Reformatory in Petersburg, Virginia. Here, he committed more crimes against other juveniles, including sodomy. So he was transferred to a maximum security facility in Ohio. So we're seeing a pattern. This, this Manson that we see as an adult that has these people following him and doing the things they're doing— his life, tumultuous life, started very early. So, 1954, he's 20 years old. Manson finally gets released. 
and he goes back to West Virginia. In 1955, he married a lady named Rosalie Jean Willis. So he stole a vehicle and drove him and Rosalie to Georgia and then to Los Angeles. But he was caught in the stolen vehicle in Los Angeles and sentenced to three years. From 1944 to 1954, Manson was in juvenile facilities and he turned the age of 21 in the L.A. County Jail. Manson spent his sentence on the stolen vehicle at Terminal Island in San Pedro, California. During this time, his wife left him, and this upset him, so he tried to escape. Well, his escape attempt kept him from getting paroled early. He was released in 1958, and at this time, he decided he was going to try a new venture. He was going to be a pimp. He had learned from the people he had been in jail with, and and he thought he could do this. But he was caught forging a U.S. Treasury check for $43, and he was given a 10-year sentence. Now, he was on probation when he began pimping another woman. He took her to New Mexico, and then he was arrested in Texas for probation violation. So this, in turn, caused him to be sent back to California to serve his sentence for the forged treasury check that he had probation for. In July 1961, he was transferred from L.A. County Jail to the U.S. Penitentiary at McNeil Island in Washington. And his prison records during those times show he was interested in Scientology, drama, softball, croquet, and playing the guitar. He had a release date set for March 21st, 1967, when he was 32 years old. But Manson asked them not to release him. I guess he had spent more of his time in prison than out. He knew he was better off in there, but they couldn't just keep him because he didn't want to leave. So he got out of prison in 1967 and goes to San Francisco with his guitar where he meets Mary Bruner soon after arriving. Mary Teresa Bruner was a 23-year-old college-educated library worker who lived near the Haight-Ashbury area in San Francisco. The Haight-Ashbury area, for those not aware, was like the mecca for hippies in the 1960s. Bruner had moved from Wisconsin to California for the purpose of working in the library in that area. Manson and Bruner had become involved in a relationship, and Manson soon moved into Bruner's apartment with her. Bruner financially supported Manson during this time. She loved that he went against the grain. I guess he was, you know how they say, they're all, the girls are always attracted to the bad boys. He was not going with the flow of mainstream life in the 60s. But Manson went against Bruner and decided to get a second girlfriend, Lynette Squeaky Frome. Obviously, Bruner wasn't happy about this, but she accepted it. And she quit her job, and the three of them traveled along the West Coast where Manson shared his visions on a free lifestyle. They did all of this while living in a van. And all along the way, they're adding more followers, mostly young women. Manson was good at turning these young women against their families and offering them free hippie lifestyle that he enjoyed. Manson kind of presented himself as a religious guru type, and his followers had to give up their identities to follow him. He claimed that his family was comprised of the original Christians who had been reincarnated, and family members truly believed that he was the second coming of Christ. Now, Manson and his followers end up in Topanga Canyon sleeping where they wanted, anywhere. Just kind of, they would carry around their sleeping bags and their belongings and basically just camp. In April of 1968, Bruner gave birth to Manson's son, Valentine Michael Manson, who was nicknamed Pooh Bear. During 1967 and 1968, Manson had begun the formation of his family, and it kind of grew. In the beginning, there were only six girls, Mary Bruner, Lynette Frome, known as Squeaky, Patricia Krenwinkel, Leslie Van Houten, Sandra Good, and Susan Atkins. So we're going to tell you a little bit about Lynette Frome. And this case is different than other true crime out loud cases that we've done because everybody has heard the general story of the Manson family. So we're trying to give you a little bit of insight, a little further than the cursory glance. And 
We all know Lynette Frome by her nickname, Squeaky Frome. She was born in Santa Monica, California, and her father was an aeronautical engineer. She was a member of the Westchester Lariats, a dance troupe, and she often toured with them. At 14 years old, her parents moved to Redondo Beach, and she began to hang out with the wrong crowd. And this is kind of where she got into underage drinking and using drugs. When she entered college, her father kicked her out because of her behavior, and so in 1967, she was basically homeless at the age of 19. And this is when she meets Manson in 1967 in Redondo Beach, and she is immediately drawn to him and his philosophies. She would eventually become Manson's closest confidant. Another original family member was Patricia Krenwinkel, and she was from Los Angeles. Her father was an insurance executive. She grew up in a normal childhood, went to church, and she said she was taught that children are to be seen and not heard. She had low self-esteem due to excessive body hair, and this was from a genetic condition. Krenwinkel's parents divorced, and she just didn't feel like she belonged. At one time, she wanted to become a nun, and she actually went to the Jesuit College, which Spring Hill College in Mobile, Alabama, but she left after one semester and returned to California. Once back there, she began working in an office as a secretary, and she was living with her half-sister, who was seven years older than her. Now, this half-sister was out of control. She introduced her to drugs, mainly LSD, as it was the popular thing at the time. When Krenwinkel was about 19, she met a man. She felt like this man could read her mind and knew what was going on inside her. He told her he loved her, and he told her she was beautiful, and they became sexually involved. Krenwinkel and this man decided they were going to be together and she was going to create a life with him. She was looking for a husband. She said she had never felt love like she did with him, even though he was 13 years older than her. This man's name was Charles Manson. When Krenwinkel was about 20, her sister died. She met Manson on the beach in 1967. And once she joined with Manson, as you will see with many of the family members, she got a new identity, and she was known as Katie. She said she slept with Manson the first night that they met, and he was the only person who had ever told her she was beautiful. Another family member, Leslie Van Houten. Now, Leslie was known as the homecoming prom queen. She's very beautiful. She was born in Altadena, California to a middle-class family, and she was actually a homecoming queen at Monrovia High School. Everyone said she was the giggly high school girl type. She briefly ran away at one point from home and went to San Francisco, but she came back. But she met Bobby Beausoleil and Catherine Gypsy Cher in the summer of 1968, and she began to travel with them. And it was through them that she met Manson. She joined the family at the age of 19. And by birthday, she was the youngest family member. Another member of the original Manson family who would play a key role in the crimes to come was Susan Atkins, a San Jose native whose mother died of cancer when Atkins was 15. The mother's death had forced her father to sell their home, and they had a bunch of bills that had, had piled up, and, and this combined stress caused Atkins to begin to fail in school, and it also caused her father to become an alcoholic. She and her siblings essentially had to fend for themselves. Their father eventually abandoned them, and they briefly lived with their grandparents, where Susan worked as a waitress and helped care for her younger brother. They also did a stint in foster care, and Susan dropped out of high school in the 11th grade. After dropping out of high school, she hitchhiked to Washington and then Oregon, where she got a ride with someone who happened to be driving a stolen car and got arrested. For this, she was given probation and moved to San Francisco, where she worked briefly as a topless dancer. She met Charles Manson, and he gave her the name Sadie. Susan was 
the more worldly or street smart of the women involved and had a more of a hard background compared to the others. One of the original male members of the Manson family was Charles Watson. You've probably heard of him by his name, nickname, Tex. From Farmersville, Texas, which is located about an hour outside of Dallas, he made good grades in high school and was known as a great athlete. Tex was a good-looking guy, well-liked, and even a church youth group leader. He attended college at North Texas State University in Denton, Texas, and he began working as a baggage handler for an airline, and he did this so that he could take free flights, and he liked to travel, and several times he went to visit a friend in California, and this is where he decided that he kind of wanted to be and settle down. He enrolled in Cal State Los Angeles, but didn't even complete his first semester. He picked up a job selling wigs in a store with one of his friends, and one evening he picked up a hitchhiker. This hitchhiker was Dennis Wilson, and anybody familiar with this time period may recognize that name. Dennis Wilson, this hitchhiker, was a member of the band The Beach Boys. He took Wilson to his home, and this is where Tex Watson met Charles Manson at Dennis Wilson's home. He ended up becoming part of the Manson family, and as we know, Wilson went on to a successful music career. Tex became Manson's right-hand man. Tex would soon meet another male associated with the Manson family that Jen's already mentioned, Bobby Beausoleil. He was called Cupid, and that was because he was said to be handsome. Bobby met Manson when he heard him playing guitar, and at the time... Bobby himself was looking for work playing the guitar. Manson and Beausoleil actually got a gig together playing guitar, but it wasn't very long until they were fired. Bobby would visit the family, but he wasn't interested in being part of the family initially. Eventually, he became a full active member of the family. And then we have Catherine Cher, who went by Gypsy. She was born in Paris, and both of her parents committed suicide when she was young. She was sent to an orphanage and was later adopted by an American family around the age of eight, and they settled in California. When she was a teenager, her adoptive mother developed cancer and killed herself. She stayed with her father, and she went to college for three years. She got married and quickly divorced. But Gypsy loved this idea of the hippie lifestyle, and she embraced it and began traveling the coast of California. She got some acting jobs in low-budget movies. She got the lead role in a low-budget movie with Bobby Beausoleil, and this movie was called Ramrodder. Now, Bobby was married at the time to a woman named Gail. But Gypsy tagged along with Bobby and Gail and traveled around with them. And she was introduced to Charles Manson through Bobby. She was the oldest of the family members at 26 in 1968. And finally, we have Linda Kasabian. Linda said she was abused by her stepfather and ran away from home at the age of 16. She had just turned 20 in July of 1969. She was married at the time and living in a travel trailer with her husband and infant. She said her husband didn't see her as a priority and she was just needing something more out of her life. Well, she met Gypsy, Catherine Cher, and Catherine was a family member by this time. So Linda loads up with her baby and Gypsy and goes to visit the family. And there was a lot of excitement and mystique around getting to meet this guy named Charlie. But Linda said she felt comfortable with the family and she was welcomed with open arms. And there were other children running around there and everybody seemed so happy. Well, she tells some of the family members that a friend of her husband's had inherited a bunch of money and she knew where to get it. So Linda gets Gypsy to drive her and Linda took this money and brings it back to the ranch. And, you know, this is like, hey, accept me because I know where to get money. Well, and they did. And she finally got to meet Manson. She said when she first met him, he got down and felt of her legs. And he had like this magnetism about him. 
She said it was like he had some kind of power. But Linda's husband and his friend wanted the money. So they showed up at Spawn Ranch where they were living at the time. Linda was scared and she hid during this event, but they wanted their money back. And to get it, they had to talk to Manson. So Manson was holding a knife and told them if they felt so strong about the money, just kill him for it. And then he told them, if I give you the right to kill me, that gives me the right to kill you. So these guys, here's this guy with a knife saying these things that really freaks them out. So they end up leaving without the money and Linda stays with the family. So we've kind of gone over the, the decade that this took place, the 1960s. We've looked at Charles Manson and where he's come from and all of the original members of the families. Hopefully you've had an opportunity to kind of pick up some stuff that maybe you didn't know about these people. I'm sure that most true crime aficionados will have heard most of these names, but like I said, I hope maybe you got to pick up some facts you didn't know. This will conclude part one of our series. And next week, in our next episode, we'll discuss life inside the Manson family. And we'll start to take a deeper look into the crimes that made them famous. We hope you enjoyed part one of the Manson family. And as always, we'll see you next week. We would like to hear your thoughts on this and all of our cases. And as always, you can reach us by email at truecrimeoutloud at gmail.com, Facebook and Instagram at truecrimeoutloud. Outloud is two words, not one, and Twitter at TCoutloud. Photos, links, and sources for this case can be found on our website at www.truecrimeoutloud.com.